After the savings and loan crisis in the 1970s and the 1980s, the government brought over a thousand criminal prosecutions and got over 800 convictions. The FBI opened nearly 5,500 criminal investigations because of referrals from banking investigators and regulators. So if we didn't even limit it to these three banks, how many prosecutions have you all regulated? You know, what we have to remember here is the main reason that we punish illegal behavior is for deterrence, you know, to make sure that the next banker who's thinking about breaking the law remembers that a guy down the hall was hauled out of here in handcuffs when he did that. These civil settlements don't provide deterrence. The shareholders for the companies pay the settlement. Senior management doesn't pay a dime. And in fact, if you're like Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, you might even get an $8.5 million raise for the settlement of negotiating such a great settlement uh, when your company breaks the law. So without criminal prosecutions, the message to every Wall Street banker is loud and clear. If you break the law, you are not going to jail, but you might end up with a much bigger paycheck. So, or paycheck. So, no one should be above the law. If you steal a hundred bucks on Main Street, you're probably going to jail. If you steal a billion bucks on Wall Street, you darn well better go to jail. Now, I know that your agencies can't bring prosecutions directly, but you are supposed to refer cases to the Justice Department when you think individuals should be prosecuted. So can you tell me how many senior executives at these three banks you have referred to the Justice Department for prosecution? for 29 plus years at Wells Fargo. So I wanna take a look at your time at Wells Fargo. From 2011 to 2014, the height of when Wells Fargo was cheating customers by opening fake accounts, you served as the chief financial officer. And as CFO, you spoke to potential Wells Fargo investors a lot. On those calls, you aggressively promoted Wells Fargo's ability to open up new accounts, didn't you? No, I didn't. No, you didn't? No. Well, here are the transcripts from all of the investor earnings calls that you mm -hmm. participated in mm -hmm. from 2011 to 2014. Mm -hmm. I've read through them, and on these calls, no one, not even John Stumpf, who was the CEO at the time, bragged more about Wells Fargo's ability and commitment to open new accounts for existing customers. You also personally owned roughly 2 million shares of Wells Fargo stock, is that right? Uh, Senator, I don't recall how much stock I owned in Wells Fargo. I'm a very well, proud shareholder. Well, it's actually in your SEC filing. Sure, so it's public. If, if that's it's all accurate, out there. then 2 million shares. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you had a really good thing going. Talk up Wells Fargo's ability to open new accounts, get investors excited, and hey, if the stock goes up by a dollar, you make a cool two million bucks. And we all know that now, it's public. You knew there was a problem, and when you were asked about it, you lied. This is about personal responsibility. Wells Fargo cheated millions of people for years. The Federal Reserve should remove all of the current board members who served during the fake account scam. And Mr. Sloan, you say you've been making changes at Wells Fargo for 30 years, but you enabled this fake account scam, you got rich off it, and then you tried to cover it up. At best, you were incompetent. At worst, you were complicit. And either way, you should be fired. Wells Fargo needs to start over, and that won't happen until the bank rids itself of people like you who led it into this crisis. It's 
well. You know, we all understand why settlements are important, that trials are expensive and we can't dedicate huge resources to them. But we also understand that if a party is unwilling to go to trial, either because they're too timid or because they lack resources, that the consequence is they have a lot less leverage in all the settlements that occur. Now, I know there have been some landmark settlements, but we face some very special issues with big financial institutions. If they can break the law and drag in billions in profits and then turn around and settle paying out of those profits, they don't have much incentive to follow the law. It's also the case that every time there's a settlement and not a trial, it means that we didn't have those days and days and days of testimony about what those financial institutions had been up to. So the question I really want to ask is about how tough you are, about how much leverage you really have in these settlements. And what I'd like to know is tell me a little bit about the last few times you've taken the biggest financial institutions on Wall Street all the way to a trial. Anybody? And what I'm asking is, when did you last take, and I know you haven't been there forever, so I'm really asking about the OCC, a large financial institution, we, a Wall Street bank, well, to uh, trial. The institutions I supervise, national banks and federal thrifts, we've actually had a, a fairly a fair number of uh, consent orders. Uh, we do not no. have to bring uh, people to uh, in a, a, a trial or a, mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that you say you don't have to bring them to trial. My question is, when did you bring them to trial? Uh, we have not had to do it as a practical matter to achieve our supervisory goals. But he does. And so the question I'm really asking is, can you identify when you last took the Wall Street banks to trial? Um, I will have to get back to you with the specific information, but we do litigate, um, and we do have settlements that are that are either rejected by the commission or not put forward for Okay, approval. we've got multiple people here. Anyone else want to tell me about the last time you took a Wall Street bank to trial? You know, I, I just want to note on this, there are district attorneys and U.S. attorneys who are out there every day squeezing ordinary citizens on sometimes very thin grounds and taking them to trial in order to make an example, as they put it. I'm really concerned that too big to fail has become too big for trial. That just seems wrong to me. a crisis. It was open season on consumers. Giant financial institutions cheated people on mortgages, on credit cards, and a bunch of other financial products, and government regulators did nothing. After the crisis, the CFPB was created to be a cop on the beat to aggressively enforce laws that protect consumers, especially those who get regularly cheated. So, Director Craninger, during your confirmation hearing, you testified, quote, under my stewardship, the Bureau will take aggressive action against bad actors who break the rules. Is that still your plan? Uh, yes, Senator, it is. I have now, I've you actually also signed said five. before you became director that the interim director, Mick Mulvaney, never made a decision you disagreed with. So let's put that together and see how you and Director Mulvaney have been doing in your combined year and a half running the CFPB. Let's start with student loans. The law that set up the CFPB established a student loan ombudsman at the Bureau because Congress believed that students needed a regulator who had their back when loan companies and for-profit colleges tried to cheat them. 
Director Craninger, in the past year and a half, how many lawsuits has the CFPB filed against student loan companies? I don't know the specific answer to that question. Well, I can tell you, because it's a matter of public record. Oh. Yes, we do have active litigation. Um, how many have area. you filed? Uh, there are two active cases in this area. Gee, what the public record seems to show is zero. No. 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 That's right. Over the past year, you could have passed on the breaks that you got from the Fed to your customers, but you didn't do it. Everybody else here, those other three bankers, will any of you agree to refund the overdraft fees that you collected? I didn't think so. As you know, the SEC's mission is to protect investors and our capital markets, and requiring companies to disclose information is a critical part of that mission. Publicly traded companies may not like disclosing potentially embarrassing or damaging information, but the SEC's job is to look out for investors, not for big companies. Now, there's a lot you could be doing to protect investors. There are still 20 mandatory Dodd-Frank rules from 2010 that the SEC hasn't completed. And there are more than a million people, including countless investors and former SEC commissioners, pushing the agency to require publicly traded companies to disclose their political contributions. But instead of moving forward on issues intended to help investors, you've actually headed in the opposite direction. Your job is to look out for investors, but you've put the interests of the Chamber of Commerce and their big business members at the top of your priority list. A year ago, I called your leadership at the SEC extremely disappointing. Today, I am more disappointed than ever. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. And I'm disappointed in your disappointment and could not agree, uh, disagree anymore with your characterization of what we're trying to do to improve our disclosure regime.